And so as you're getting ready to turn there, there are some things that you know, we need to realize is, is that the, the epistle to the Hebrews is a, a unique letter written to the believers and Christians who most likely were converted away from Judaism. They, uh, so why, do you, why would somebody need to be converted away from Judaism? Because oftentimes people sit there and say, well, the Jewish faith is so close to Christianity, it's just the fact that they haven't accepted Jesus Christ, the Son. You know, they'll say, well, you know, they believe the Old Testament, they just don't believe the New Testament. We believe the you know, Old and New Testament. They're so close. Well, the problem you know, with that way of thinking is that a lot of Jewish people, the vast majority of them, don't believe in the Old Testament. Or they do to a certain point. They believe that it's a nice fairy tale. And they don't believe the stories that are actually in, uh, you know, in the Old Testament. But they, uh, today they believe the, the Talmud, which is the rabbinical teachings, the teachings of the rabbis. And so um, people oftentimes, you know, say, you know uh, when they go along those, uh, that frame of mind of saying, well, they just, they just don't believe the New Testament, they just don't believe in Jesus. Well, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 12, or, or sorry, 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, there's not 12 chapters in the, uh, in the book of 1 John. So if you're looking for it and you can't find it, there's a reason for it because it's not there. But in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, it says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John chapter 2, verse 23 says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So the Bible says basically, you know what, they're not saved because of the fact is, is that they don't believe in Jesus Christ the Son. And so uh, there's this wicked teaching you know, that's going on right now that says, you know what, the Jewish people, the Hebrews, don't need to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Why? Because they're God's chosen people. One of the big proponents of this would be John Hagee. If you ever heard of you know, John Hagee, he's on TV, he's on you know, uh, TBN and all that stuff. He teaches the fact that you don't need to talk to the Jewish people about Jesus. Why? Because you know, according to him, they're God's chosen people and they're already saved. The Bible te- clearly teaches against that, saying, you know what, they have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And so I, I tell you all that, you know, so that way if you've heard that, you know, that false teaching, you know, that, that damnable heresy, that you would not fall for that and say, you know what, I don't need to talk to this person, this Jewish person about Jesus because they're already saved. No, they're not. They're not saved. They need to know Jesus. And the funny thing is, is that you go around and you have a lot of people that teach, they say, well, they're a messianic Jew. The Bible doesn't teach that either. The Bible says that when you, uh, when you have become a believer on Jesus Christ, that you leave that old religion behind. So the thing is that, you know, of, of Messianic Jews going around and they're, you know, got the scrolls and they, they're still wearing the yarmulkes and they're still doing all the same stuff they did when they were Jewish, they shouldn't be doing. Why? Because we have a new, we have a better covenant. We have a New Testament, right? Amen. And that's what they're supposed to follow and teach. They're supposed to leave all that wickedness behind. Because you say, well, why is it wickedness? Because more than likely, it's not, it, it's not biblical Christianity. It's not even biblical at all. What it is is that they're following the teachings of rabbis who are, are what? Men. And it's very wicked, the Talmud you know, actually is. And so the Jewish people, you know, during the times of Christ and the apostles believed, uh, the Jewish people you know, during that time, during the, yeah, during the times of, of Christ and the apostles, believed in their traditions. They believed in tr- traditions much like the Talmud. And, and how do I know this? Because we see this in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. It says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do, they, why, uh, why do uh, thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So God's you know, saying, you know what? You're making your tradition higher than God's commandments. John chapter 5, verses 46 and 47 says, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Jesus said it himself. He says, you know what? If you believe Moses, you would have you know, accepted me, basically. Jesus he, uh, flat out even says that. He says, because oftentimes what you'll see with the scribes and the Pharisees and even the Jewish people is, they say, we follow Moses. We follow, and Jesus says that if you were to follow Moses, if you were to follow what he wrote, it points to me anyways. And if you were to have, you would have found me. Because 
Moses was writing of me, of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. Let's, uh, we're going to read uh, the whole chapter, even though that this morning we're only going to uh, hit the first three verses. All right? Verse 1. God who, had, uh, God, who had sundry times in diverse manners, spank in times uh, past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath he in these last days spoke unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his Son, and upholding all, thi- uh, all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right, uh, right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better, uh, so much better than the angels, as he hath been, uh, by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten, uh, begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto, uh, unto the son he hath, he saith, they... Sorry, thy, uh, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of, uh, of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, have, uh, hath appointed or hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, uh, and thou Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they, uh, and they all shall wax old as of a garment. And as a vesture <coughs> shalt, uh, shalt uh, thou f- uh, fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou, uh, but thou art the, the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels say, uh, say he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not, not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the, uh, the heirs of salvation? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I ask this morning that you would fill me with your spirit to overflowing, Lord, that, that the words that I speak would bring life. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would not just be hearers of, uh, of the word, but Lord, that, that we would be uh, doers as well. And God, uh, that your word would be as a fire shut up in my bones. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, the book of Hebrews is unique in, the sen- in this sense, is that the author is not mentioned like the other epistles. It's the only uh, a letter or epistle that um, at the beginning doesn't say who wrote it. Plus, it starts off, you know, a reading like it's an essay, then it progresses to a sermon, then ending as a regular letter or an epistle. It also was most, uh, it was, uh, most likely written before the destruction of the, temple, uh, the second temple. Why? Because they didn't make no mention of it. And the reason why Paul, or I, believe it's, uh, you know, I believe it was written by Paul, and I'll get into that here in a moment. But the reason why that is is because I believe that he, he's going through the person that wrote this is, uh, is going to go through Hebrews, and he's going to talk about sacrifices as well. And so why would, why would, they, why would the person that wrote this talk about um, sacrifices if sacrificing wasn't still going on if the temple had been destroyed? And the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And like I said, I believe that this letter is written by the Apostle Paul. Other people say that they think it's other people. And whatever the reason, you know, some of the reasons why I believe that, this, you know, that the book of Hebrews was written by Paul is because of the of different times, different statements that he makes, and all that. One of them being Habakkuk chapter two, verse four, which states, "The just shall live by his faith, or the just shall live by faith." And so Paul uses this. He's the only uh, apostle. He's the only writer in the New Testament that uh, points to this verse of saying that the just shall live uh, by faith. 
Also, no other writer than, uh, uh, sorry, and Paul uses that in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Also, the early church believed the letter was written by Paul. To me, you know, uh, there's other reasons, there's more reasons that I believe that Paul wrote this, but to me, if, if the early church was one, uh, one of the ones that believe that Paul wrote it, I'm going to believe that Paul wrote it as well. Because you know what, they're closer to him, you know, they're closer to that time as well. And also, you know what? You can, you, know, you can sit there and say, you know, you believe that Apollo you know, wrote it or that Barnabas wrote it or Timothy wrote it or Luke wrote it or any of these other possible ones that wrote it. But you know what? It doesn't really matter why because I believe that the Lord has preserved his word and this is God's word. Amen. And so, so for so many people, the reason why that oftentimes they want, to, they want to have a big argument about the author is because they want to discount the book. They want to discount this letter because the things that are talked about in Hebrews, they don't like. And so they want to get rid of it. Especially, who do you think would actually not like the book of Hebrews? The Jewish people. Because in the book of Hebrews, you know, the main purpose of this, you know, the main purpose of the book of Hebrews, it's a letter of, of exhortation, of encouragement, of strengthening. Why? Because there was intense persecution happening at this time. I mean, right before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, people were being martyred because of, you know, before their, uh, because of their faith by the Jewish people. So Christians were being martyred by the Jewish people. Why? Because the Jewish people were trying to get rid of Christians. And so right around the same time, you know, that we are reminded of how, you know, uh, we're going to see and be reminded of how blessed we are that we have trusted in Christ when we read the book of Hebrews. We are we're going to be in, uh, we should be impressed with the superiority of Christ and his new co uh, his new covenant over Moses and the old covenant. And we are warned of the danger of apostasy, of abandoning, of falling away, of backsliding from uh, from sound biblical teaching and doctrine. And that, and we uh, need uh, we need steadfastness in our faith. That is one thing that oftentimes that I think we miss is being steadfast, that we're not going to be moved no matter what happens. Oftentimes people, you know, they, they face some form of persecution, some sort of trial, some sort of tribulation, and what ends up happening is they, they begin to waver. Paul is telling them that, you know what, because, you know, just because you're facing this intense persecution, don't go back to Judaism. Don't go back to that. It's like, it's like Paul saying, don't go back to Egypt. And what happened you know, with the Israelites in the Old Testament? That's what they wanted to do. They forgot all the stuff. They forgot all the bondage. They forgot all the slavery. They forgot all the false things that were going on. And they said, you know what? We need to go back there. It was great being enslaved. And so Paul said, you know what? Just because you're facing intense persecution, just because you have trials, just because you have tribulation, remain steadfast. Yeah. Remain steadfast. The book of Hebrews is divided into three uh, main divisions. The superiority of Christ, the superiority of the New Testament or the New Covenant, and, it, uh, gives, uh, and there's exhortations or encouragement that are drawn from the superiority. If I was going to title this series, I would put it this way, that Jesus is better. Because you're going to find out I haven't named it that, but if I was going to, that's what I would call it, is Jesus is better. Because throughout the book, I mean, even in the first chapter, what does he say? That Jesus is better than the angels. He's going to say Jesus is better than, you know, than the prophets. That Jesus is better overall. Amen? There are six warnings you're also going to find in this epistle. There's warning against drifting. There's a warning against departing. There's a warning against disobedience. A warning against dullness. Warning against despising and a warning against defying. We're going to see all of these, you know, throughout this book that you know, Paul is warning: do not do this, because if you do, you're going to backslide. You're going to fall away. And when it talks, the Bible talks about abandoning your faith. It has nothing to do with the loss of salvation. It has everything to do with the fact that all of a sudden you're going to begin to deny that you're saved in the first place, even though that you know that you are. Okay. So when the Bible talks about falling away or you know, apostate, it's usually it, it, you, you begin to fall away from sound biblical teaching and people you know, will begin to follow things you know, that their itching ears want to hear.
This morning I've entitled this this sermon simply this. When he speaks. When he speaks. My first point is this. He spoke in time past. He spoke in time past. Let's look at verse 1 and verse 2. It says, God who at sundry times or different times times and in diverse manners or in different ways spoke or spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath he uh, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son that expression of in time past refers to the period of time prior to jesus coming this would be from genesis to malachi all right so when he says in times past he's talking about before that it says god it says god spoke unto the fathers by the prophets, the fathers, obviously ancestors of the Israelites. The fathers, you know, the fathers that he refers to are the ancestors of the Israelites. The prophets would include great men such as like Samuel, Elijah, um, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and so on. And the word prophet simply means this. Yes, it does mean about foretelling, but it main meaning of a prophet is a person who is a, a illuminated, inspired, or instructed by God. It is also a messenger of God or a preacher of the gospel. Oftentimes in the New Testament, when it uses the word prophet, it means pastor or preacher of the gospel. That's what it means. It does not mean that we're going to have future prophecies. Why? Because the canon of Scripture is closed. The Bible is closed. We're not adding any more uh, scripture to the, word, to the word of God. So when people get up and say, I have a prophecy, if it does not line up with what the word of God says, then you know what? It's not a prophecy. It's a lie. It's a prophet lying. And like I said, obviously, it's, it's a person, uh, it, it's one, uh, it refers to one who is inspired by God to speak for him as a, as a preacher. We see this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 21. It says this, For the prophecy came not in the old time but uh, by the will of man, but holy men, spank, uh, holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, obviously when a scripture was being written, God moved them to speak and to write. And at different times, the prophets themselves didn't always necessarily know what they were writing. They knew that they were writing down God's word. They knew what it was, but they didn't understand it. You say, well, how can they write it but not understand it? Why? Because it wasn't revealed to them yet. But yet they were, they were moved by God, to, uh, moved by the Holy Spirit to write these things. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, uh, verses 10 through 12. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of grace that should come unto, uh, unto you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto, them, uh, unto you by them that, ha- uh, that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which are things the angels desire to look into. So when they were writing things, not all every single time were they writing something that they understood. They wrote so we could understand. Because it was re, it's revealed unto us. We see this you know, happening with the prophet Daniel. In Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 and 9, he even says, you know what? He even asked God, like, how come I don't understand this? And God says, it's not for you to understand. Let's look. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 and 9 says this. And I heard, but I understood not. Then, I, uh, then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. He flat out tells him, he says, you know what? It's not for you to know. It's for those that are going to be in the end times, in the last days. It's not for you to understand these things. As I said earlier, you know, when it says God spoke at sundry times and in diverse manners, that his revelation didn't come all at once, but it was, prog- uh, it was progressively at different times. Certain things were revealed to certain people over a period of time, right? We know that the Bible was written, you know, uh, was written by 40 plus authors, right? Over a period of like 1,500 years. And God began to reveal those things. 
His, his methods varied at what he did. He used visions, he used dreams, he used symbols, he used all kinds of different things. I mean, think about Hosea. How symbolic his life was. And how much, you know, how terrible it had to be for him to actually go through that. If you don't know, Hosea married a prostitute. God told him to. He said, marry a prostitute. And this woman was not faithful to her marriage vows. She still continued to be a prostitute, still continued to do all those things. And that entire situation, I mean, think about it. You're a husband, you know, and your spouse, your wife, is unfaithful to you. And God says, that's how it's going to be. He says, why? Because, the, you know, it's going, to be, it's going to show my people, Israel, that they are being unfaithful. That they're going to come back to me, and they're going to go back and be unfaithful. They're going to come back to me, and they're going to be unfaithful. They're going to come back to me, and then they're going to be unfaithful over and over again. He says, your life is, is, a, uh, is an example. I mean, obviously, for Jose, he's going... You know, I married this woman, she's unfaithful, and God tells him that she's going to be unfaithful to him, no matter what, all these different times. How would you like to have that example? You know, God, you know, God use you as an example in that way. That would not be a good way. But he uses different methods, he uses different ways to get us to understand. And even when he does do that, we still don't understand. I mean, I oftentimes think, you know, uh, th- you know, that for myself, I guess be so, you know, so bullheaded, so, you know, so bullheaded, so, so um, hard-headed that it's like God has to take a two-by-four and crack me over the head with it in order for me to understand it. And say, and God's saying, are you going to listen to me and actually finally begin to listen to me? I mean, obviously he doesn't do that, but it sometimes it almost feels like he has to do that in order to get my attention. I don't know about you. Is it just me, you know, that God does that, you know, too? Other ones are like, yep, that's exactly you. I listen every single time the Lord speaks. <laughs> I do, too. I listen every single time he speaks. Do I listen to it and actually follow it? No. But it also says, that, uh, obviously, he spoke in times past uh, uh, unto the fathers by the prophets. How does God speak to us to, uh, today? By his son, Jesus Christ, who is the living word of God. The Bible is how God obviously speaks to us today. This is how God speaks to you. That's why it cannot be added to, it cannot be you know, changed or anything else. Why? Because it is God's word. And you have people, I, I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. There was a lady at a prior church that we went to, and this lady got up, did not use God's word. I can tell you that because as soon as I say what, it, you know, what the prophet lie was, you'll know what, why it wasn't God's word. She got up and she began you know, to talk and she said, the Holy Spirit is like a machine gun mowing down God's people. And I said, Arr? I mean, I sat there and I'm going, that's not of the Lord. And then she, in the middle of it, she changed it. She said, oh, no, no, that's not it. And then began to change what, you know, what it was. I said, did God just correct himself in the middle of a message? God's not going to correct himself. What he speaks is truth, and he wants you speaking his truth. He go, you go to his word. You don't sit there and just you know, uh, uh, say what you want to say and just go, yeah, that's the Lord. No, it's not. You're not God. Like I said, there is no new revelation. God gave us what we needed to know. He gave us God's word. Why were we going to add to it? Doesn't Revelation speak of adding to God's word and taking away God's word? I don't think that we should be doing that. So you know, so you know, we know obviously God has you know clearly, uh, God has clearly revealed him, uh, Himself as one who speaks. He communicates you know His will to uh, to mankind. What He revealed through His prophets in time past is certainly wonderful, but now considering consider what we learn regarding it because he also speaks number two is this he speaks in these last days as i mentioned earlier in these last days obviously the last days are the time between christ left uh you know uh, that you know christ died upon the cross left and went back into heaven until the end of the age until his second coming 
That's the end times. That's the last days. That's the part, you know, uh, that we are living in right now is the last days. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, uh, now once in the, uh, in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. How did he put it away? By his sacrifice. By him dying upon the cross and raising, us, uh, raising to new life. Raising us to new life. That's how Jesus Christ did away with sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says this, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, that, uh, and that, uh, they are written for admonition or encouragement, upon whom the ends of the world are come. God has spoken to, uh, unto us by his Son. God has, sp- uh, you know, God has spoken once again. But I want you to look at this. But I, I want you to look at the contrast here. What does it say? That at first it was what? It was by the, uh, the fathers unto the prophets. What changes? Now he has spoken unto us by what? His son. God has spoken to us by his son. He, God's word is, Jesus Christ is the living word. God has sent his own son to speak for him. It's not through the prophets. It's not through anyone. It's through his son. And as wonderful as the prophets were, how can they compare to God's own son? There is no, uh, there's no contrast, especially as we read on and we notice these things. What, number three is this. When he speaks, it's perfect. God does not change in the middle. He does not change his word and go, oops, I didn't mean that. Sharpie, where's the Sharpie at? That's, you know. God doesn't do that. When he speaks, it's perfect. Jesus, we'll notice that it says Jesus is the appointed heir of all things. He is the uh, the appointed heir of all things in verse 2. Now, the author may have had Psalm uh, chapter 2, verse 8 in mind because of the fact that he he quotes uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 and verse 5. And what does he say in, uh, in, verse, uh, in uh, chapter 2, verse 8? He says that he has, uh, uh, ask of me and I'll give the nations unto you. Or sorry, I'll give the, the heathen unto you as an inheritance. As the beloved son, it is only natural that he would, that he would be the appointed heir. Why? And what, what do these all things include? He's the appointed heir, right? But it says, of all things. What are these all things? All that the Father has, Jesus Christ has as well. Why? Because he's God. John chapter 15, verse 16 talks of this. The authority, he also, the all things, he has the authority to raise and to judge the dead. We see this in John chapter 5, verse, verses 26 and 29, that he has the authority to raise and judge the dead. Because you know there are two resurrections, Right? There's a resurrection of the living, and there's a resurrection of damnation. He's going to judge the living and the dead. He's going to judge those that are saved and those that are not saved. The believer and the heathen. He also has the authority to rule in heaven and on earth. Matthew uh, Matthew 28, verse 18. This authority Christ has now. It's not something that he's going to get in, in the future. He's always had the authority. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22 says, Who is gone into heaven and is, on, uh, and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. All these are subject unto him. He's the one who has authority. Jesus is by whom also he made the worlds. Now think about this. He's not only just an heir, but he also is the creator. He made the worlds. He made the universe. He made the solar system. He made the galaxies. He made all this. I remember, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, a, a little girl was sitting down there on a Wednesday night and asked the question, how strong is God? How big is God? And I said, God is, a, you know, huge. He's strong. I said, think about it. He, I said, he not only created this world with his own hands, but he also created our solar system, our galaxy, the universe. I said, he's able to do whatever he wants by the sound of his voice. He's just able to speak it and it happens. 
And I'm not talking about the whole name and claim it, blab it, grab it, you know, uh, you know uh, trash that's out there. I'm talking about the fact that God himself is able to speak those things into existence. We are not. You say, well, I'm claiming, you know, God's, you can claim God's promises, you, be, you know, believe it, whatever, but you don't go up to a BMW and say, I, I believe that God wants me to have a Beamer. Or I want, you know, God wants me to have this mansion. You know what it's called? It's called hard work, and if you get there, you get there, and you'll be able to have those things. But you know what the other way is? Being faithful to God. The way that you get there is by working hard and being faithful to God. How are you faithful to God? By paying your tithe and your offering. Uh-oh. The Bible says to do what? That if you give your tithe unto the Lord, it says, trust me in these things. And to see, you know, if I don't open the floodgates of blessing. And oftentimes, what do we, the floodgates of blessing that we look at, oftentimes we're going, oh, God's going to give me money. That's what God wants. Me. No, God wants you to have good health. Because you know what? If you don't have good health, then how are you going to enjoy anything else? A good family? A good, you know, a, a, you know, being faithful in reading God's word and studying God's word? Being faithful with these things. Because God wants you to be able to, um, to be able to see others get saved through you. I heard somebody one time, you know, come here, and it's actually here in town in Crothersville. I, I remember this person came up, and they said, you know what, I believe that God wanted me to have this house. So I began to claim it in Jesus' name. Now, the house that they picked, you know, wasn't like some, you know, I just want to have a roof over my head. No, they wanted to go above and beyond and everything else, and they can barely make the payments on the house. Do you think that God wants you to live, you know, in the area that you're barely making it? You know what? Live within your means. This sermon isn't about, you know, your tithe and your offering and all that kind of stuff. But the thing is that oftentimes people have this idea, well, I got to have the most expensive car. I got to do this and this and this. And there are churches that teach that. There are, there are churches out there that say that a pastor is not, that the pastor is not able to afford the fine thing, the finer things in life or have the best cars or whatever, that somehow they're being unfaithful to God and they can lose their salvation because of it. You know how much a bunch of gibberish that is? Like I said, he's not, Jesus Christ is not only the heir, but he is the creator. He created all things. And we are to enjoy the, you know, things in life. The thing is, is that we are to enjoy what he has created, not what man has created. You know why? Because the things that man create fall apart. I've seen you know, people you know, way too many times saying that they, you know, they, that they believe that God wanted them to have this, 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 and this, and that. And all it is is that they just wanted to have the latest and greatest so they can sit there and just boast and brag about themselves and not about the Lord. You know what? Consider yourself blessed when you have a roof over your head. Consider yourself blessed when you, uh, when you have food on your table. Consider yourself blessed when you have clothes on your back. Consider yourself blessed you know, th- that you woke up breathing this morning. Don't sit there and, you know, and always get, you know, say, i got to have the, you know, the biggest and best and the latest and greatest mumbo jumbo, because that's what the world wants. And that's the only thing that the world can offer is that stuff that in, you know, in a year or so was going to be looked at as being, oh, that's old. You know, right now I have a phone in my pocket that's over a year old. Oh, my goodness. I am on such old technology. You know what? It makes phone calls. I'm glad. I believe that's what a phone's supposed to be for, right? John chapter 1, verse 3 says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in, uh, that are in earth, visible and invisible, uh, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus is the brightness of his, uh, of his glory, of God's glory. In Jesus, we see the radiance of the glory of God. As John wrote in, in uh, John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. When we behold Jesus, we behold the only begotten of the Father. Jesus is the express image of his, of his person, of God. Uh, of God. 
He is the exact representation of God's being and character. John, oh, sorry, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And by the way, the word Godhead literally is talking about and speaking of the Trinity. That's how the Bible puts it as the Godhead. So for those that, you know, that, you know, that, that sit there and say that the, the Trinity doesn't exist because it's not in the Bible, well, the word Godhead is in the Bible, and that's what it is speaking of is the Trinity. Therefore, obviously, Jesus could say to Thomas in John chapter 14, verse 7, it says, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. And he could also say this to, to Philip in John chapter 14, verse 9, a few verses later, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Why? Because they are one and the same. The three are one. Jesus is upholding all things by the word of his power. Not only the creator, but he's also the sustainer of the universe. By his word. By the word of his, uh, of his power. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Without Jesus, we're not here. Like literally, we're not here. If we don't have Jesus, we don't exist. If Jesus didn't exist, if God didn't exist, we're not here. And if you know, the people out there say, you know, well, well, who created God? Who created Jesus? He's God. He's always been. He always is. He always will be. We may not understand it. We don't have to understand it. We just have to believe it. Now, some people will say, well, I don't want to believe it if I don't understand it. Then you know what? Then how do you follow evolution? Because there's no way you can even understand that, let alone follow it, because it doesn't make sense. But yet the fact of, you know, that there's a God of the universe that created all things by his, you know, the word of his power, and we sit there and we go, I don't know if I can believe that there's a God, but I'll believe that I came from a monkey. Oh, sorry. No, I'll believe that I came from some sort of pri primordial pond scum that came, oh, wait, no, no, no. I'm going to believe that a squid came across on a comet and fell down here, and somehow we evolved from that. Yeah, that makes sense. But we can't believe that there's a God who loves us, who created us, who designed us, and wants us to follow him and believe on him. That we are created for his good pleasure. No, we can't believe that. Why would we ever want to believe? Because if we had to believe that, then we would have to sit there and say, you know what? I have to listen to him and actually follow what he wants for my life. The problem is, is that people that don't want, you know, that want to believe in evolution, that don't want to believe in Jesus Christ, is the fact that they still want to be in control of their life, and they're not. That's the problem that they have. And they don't want to get over it. Because their song is, it's all about me. That's the song that they sing every single day, it's all about me. Think about it. By his word, the universe holds together. All he has to do is say the word, and the universe is no more. That's how powerful, how mighty, how strong God is. And sometimes we take that for granted, don't we? I mean, just think about it. If he says, you know, I don't want the universe to stand anymore, I don't want it to be, he just says it, it's gone. Obviously, this illustrates the power of his word. And shall we not listen when he speaks? Like it's stated in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, it says, And why call, why, call, oh, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? God has asked us to do certain, you know, uh, certain things in life. He's asked us to do th certain things, and oftentimes... We don't do what he asks us to do. But here's the thing. It says, you know, it says later in, the, in that verse, it says, Jesus has also by himself purged our sins. We couldn't do it. He did. Jesus Christ forgave our sins, purged our sins, cleansed our sins, so that they are no more. And obviously we know that this is a clear reference to his death on the cross for our sins. That this speaks to his role as our redeemer. And this is a main thing that we're going to see out throughout the book of Hebrews, you know, that will be you know, prominent later on. We'll actually probably you know, see it here in a couple weeks. 
Jesus also sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is what Jesus did when he ascended to heaven. He didn't just all of a sudden ascend there and go, gee, I wonder where I can go. No, he, he sat in the place of honor. Why? Because he's God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 says, Who he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, Who is gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. He's seated at the right hand of God, in the, like I said, in the place of honor. But for Jesus, it is the place where he's always been. Why? Because he forever reigns. It wasn't something that all of a sudden that had to be created because, uh-oh, I don't know what to do. No, Jesus Christ has always reigned. He's always been, he has all, and he always will be, even if we don't want to acknowledge it. Even if we as, as humans sit there and say, you know what, I don't believe that there's God. He still reigns. Even if people sit there and they, they defiantly say that Jesus Christ didn't exist. Oh, no, wait. Well, he did exist, but he's only a good teacher. Or he did, he's a good moral, uh, good moral person. Or he did this, this. No, even if people want to deny him, he still reigns. Nothing changes that. Jesus reigns no matter what. No matter how much humanity wants to deny his existence, he still reigns. Why? Because he's king of kings and he's lord of lords. No matter what happens... He still reigns. Nothing's going to change that. Satan's not going to all of a sudden get more power than him. The devil, you know, the devil, you know, and and his devils and all that are not going to change any of that. They're not going to. They think that they are because they got the attitude that they're going to be bigger than God. Well, gee, I wonder where humanity gets that idea that they're going to be better than God, that they're bigger than God. I mean, Jesus Christ is waiting for his enemies to be, uh, to be made his footstool. Now think about that. He already knows that they're going to be his footstool. Some place that he props his feet up. That's who his enemies are. They're going to be uh, made his footstool, uh, his footstool. But until then, he still reigns. In Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2, in which, obviously, uh, you know, the, the writer of Hebrews is, is quoting in these verses that I just read, it says that Jesus Christ is to rule in the midst of thy enemies. Jesus is, obviously, truly, truly ruler over all the earth, no matter, no matter what. And not only over the earth, but over the entire universe. Why? Because he spoke it into existence. Psalm 103, verse 19 says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. It's not just over the earth, it's over all, everything. You have ones out there like Elon Musk and all that, or that are sitting there trying to get space travel because, they, you know, because somebody had the idea of, you know, of going to Mars. I mean, think about that. Humanity has been around as long as it has been, you know, about 6,000, 7,000, you know, about 6,000 years or so, and they're still trying to get to Mars. You would think with all the, you know, the bright eyes and everything else and all the technology and everything else that people would be smarter and, you know, and they're trying to get to Mars. Shouldn't they be like Star Trek and Star Wars and traveling to distant worlds by now? I mean, we're so much better than every, you know, you know, uh, than God, you know, and yet we cannot, that's the farthest we can go. And he said, well, you don't realize how far that is? No, I'm serious. 6,000 years that you know, man, humanity has been around, and the farthest we can get, and we haven't gotten there, is Mars. We haven't even figured out how to get out of our, you know, out of our own solar system. Actually, we haven't even figured out how to get, you know, get to the next planet that we're next to. I said, well, you know how difficult? Well, we're so much better than God. Yeah, we should be exploring bold new worlds like Star Trek talks about. But we're not. And I want to remind you, you know, uh, as I conclude, you know, uh, as I conclude here is, is that what I read in verse 3, all of that, the sentence still goes on into verse 4. 
It, it, it continues on into verse 4 with a declaration that Jesus is superior or is better than the angels. But that verse is obviously, and yeah, the rest of the chapter, you know, is going to be for next week. I mean, could you begin to see that when God speaks, things happen? That when God says something, it's going to happen. That we don't have to question what God's word says. Why? Because God said it. I mean, I don't understand why people sit there and try to explain away the, you know, the writer of Hebrews. Or they try to explain away why. The reason why is because they don't like what, you know, what a certain book says. So they're like, you know what, I'm not going to believe it. So they can go on, you know, putting, sticking their head in the sand and saying, I don't have to follow what God's word already says. That's the reason why people try to explain away certain things. There's people that were trying to get a word of Jude. Small little book in the you know, Bible. There, basically, a lot of the New Testament people have tried to sit there and say, you know what, this shouldn't be there. Why? Because that book spoke of something that they didn't want to deal with. You know what? Believe God's word. He spoke it. He knows what's best. I mean, be grateful that you have this. Because people say, you know what, I don't know how to do life. I don't know how to raise my kids. I don't know how to go to work. I don't know how to do the things. I don't know how to. You have it right here. God tells you. He, he spoke it through men of old, like he says. That they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God, and they wrote it down. God says, you know what, I'm gonna, not only going to create you, I'm going to give you a book that will teach you how to live life. And yet people sit there and go, no, he didn't. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm thankful, I'm grateful that God gave us this word so that way I know how to do life. Because you know what? When I was doing it on my own, I, I screwed it up. I messed it up. I was, a, I was a horrible mess because I was told to stay away from this book because it wasn't going to do anything for me. But then the thing is, is that I, as I, you know, as I, you know, when I got saved and I began to read what God's word said, I began to go through it and everything else. I said, you know what? How could I have been, been so stupid? And the more that I read God's word, I realize how much I don't know about him. But that's not a discouragement. To me, it's something for me to, you know, to strive for. Because I go, you know what? I don't understand everything in God's word. I don't have to. I just have to understand what God told me to do this day. He doesn't expect me to understand this entire book. But the main message is what? That God saves people from sin. That's what I need to know. Everything else is a bonus. Everything else, God said, you know what? Not only am I going to save you from your sin, but I'm also going to make it to where you understand life and how to do life and how to be the best you know, person that you could possibly be, how you could be you know, a believer in Jesus Christ that people would look up to you so they can look to me. Because you know what? We have to be able to, to live life in a way that people want to know the Lord. We have to be able to live life. We have to be able to do things, you know, uh, we have to be able to do things and everything else that is above reproach. Why? So other people would come to know him. If our desire is that we don't want to, you know, uh, make him known, God says you could do that. You know that? God says that you can actually just get saved and not do a thing, you know, ever again. But you know what ends up happening, and this is not you know, a way to like, you know, terrify you or you know, whatever, but you should be. You see throughout you know, the Bible that those that sit there and they get saved or they begin to do their own thing and they begin to you know, become apostate and they begin to go you know, backslide and all those things, that God takes them out early. He does. He takes them out early. Do you think that Samson was supposed to die when he died? Do you think that King Saul was supposed to die as young as he did? No. They began to backslide. They began to do those things. Yeah, they got saved, but then they said, you know what? It's all about me. And God took him out early. He did. But that's why the Bible says, you know, for us to do what? If we honor the Lord, he's going to make our days long. If we honor our mother and our father, he's going to make our days long. So you know what? If you live longer than most, you know, most of your friends and everything else, praise the Lord. Why? Because the Lord thought that you were, uh, you know, are, uh, you know, that you are able. <clears throat> excuse me. That you are doing something right about preaching the gospel to others, and you say, "Well, I don't know if I am really, really pastor. I don't know if I, or if I really am." Well, you know what? Change that. 
Do what you can do. God's going to, at different points in life, if you have different ailments, do what you can do. If you're not able to you know, walk around, move around, or anything else, do what you can do. So what we have we seen from these verses is that God is a God who clearly speaks. He makes his will known to mankind, and he speaks through his Son, who is what? Appointed heir of all things. He is the creator. He is the brightness of God's glory. He is the express image of his person. He is our sustainer, our redeemer, and our king. And I hope that these three verses obviously encourage you to continue to live your life for his glory, especially when the majesty on high proclaimed at the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. In other words, listen to this man. Listen to him because he's God incarnate. What we need to do is give heed to the words of the beloved son when he speaks to you this week. God wants to speak to you this week. Will you listen? Will you listen? When God speaks, will you listen? Because you know what? He's better than anything, anything in this life. He's better than the next iPhone that's going to you know, come out here in a few months. He's better than you know, the most expensive car. The most, you know, he's better than you know, a Lamborghini. He's better than a mansion. He's better than anything that we could ever dream that we think is better. He's better than that. But when he speaks, we should be willing to listen. Why? Because he always has our best interests in mind. The Bible says, you know, Bible says, you know, cast all your care upon him. Why? Because he careth for you. In other words, cast all your anxiety, all your fears, all those things. Why? Because he cares for you. When he speaks, he means it. When he speaks, it's perfect. Don't try and change God's word to suit your own needs. Read God's word and obey it, right? Oftentimes people get themselves in trouble. Why? It's because they keep doing their own thing. So let's listen you know, to God and say, you know what? You know, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. In other words, listen to him. So for the next few moments as they play, I want you to begin to say, you know what, you know, God, you know what, I'm sorry that maybe I haven't been listening to you, that I haven't been following you, that when you speak to me, I haven't been listening, that I've heard it, but I didn't want to do it. You say, you know what, God, I want to hear you, and I want to be able to not only hear you, but to do it. So in the next few moments, I want you to begin to think of those areas in which you say, you know what, I'm not going to listen. Just say, you know what, I want to listen. Thank you.